So um, my name is Rich Bowen, and I've been doing open source since before we started calling it that. And uh, I am very passionate about open source and about communities. And uh, before my current job, I worked at Red Hat, where in theory, anyway, everyone understood and was passionate about open source. And as a result, when you talk passionately about open source, um, it goes over well. Now I work at AWS, which is a much larger company with a much deeper management structure. And when you talk passionately about open source, um, it doesn't always communicate quite as well. Um, and what I've been learning over the past two years is that uh, you need to educate yourself on how to speak to management and communicate the ROI, the return on investment. So what I'm hoping is that my, my audience here is, is kind of in line with that thinking. You care about open source. Um, you maybe, hopefully, you also care about your company succeeding. And uh, you understand that your manager cares about results and that those two things are not in conflict with one another. So I'm not talking about lying to your company. I'm talking about translation. I'm talking about learning a new language. Um, ideally, you are interested in the success of your company. And ideally, you understand that doing open source well is not just for the benefit of the open source project or some nebulous concept of community, but that doing open source well also benefits your company long term. Um, the, the meta reason that I care about this and I want you to care is that as open source has become critical to businesses over the last decade, more companies are consuming open source without understanding it. And they treat it like a shrink-wrapped product that they consume rather than as a living entity that they maybe should participate in. And uh, if open source is critical to the sustainability of your company, then you should care about the sustainability of the open source. But you also need to communicate that to people who have no interest or understanding in how that thing is made. Now, the funny thing about this slide is that I gave this presentation to a, uh, shall we say, a much younger audience in Mexico a few months ago. And I, I had to explain what those things were. I hope that everyone here understands what those objects are. Um. <laughs> All right, so uh, backing up a step, think about why you are passionate about open source. Um, the reasons that people tend to give are, you know, some of them are job related. Um, I'm doing this because I'm getting paid for it. That is a perfectly legitimate reason to participate in open source. But especially for those of us that have been doing it for longer, our motivations um, are different or maybe have changed over the years. There was a survey that was done on opensource.com uh, almost 10 years ago. Yeah, I, I, see, I see the expression on Brian's face that I'm citing this survey. Um, and whether it was scientifically rigorous is not a question that I'm going to address here. But um, reasons about reasons for doing open source other than directly about your career tend to fall into several big categories. Um, one of them is education learning something new, uh, expanding my skill set, improving my resume, uh, creating job opportunities for myself. And several of those pipe slices fit into that. Another category is because it's fun. Uh, Linus Torvalds wrote a book called, what was his book called? Um, for, for the fun of it, or I, I forget what exactly the title was, about how when he created the Linux operating system, his primary motivation was amusement. He did it because it was enjoyable. The fact that it has become a multi-trillion dollar industry that runs all of IT on the planet was an unexpected outcome of that. 
Another, a third major category is altruism. I am doing this to make the world a better place. I'm doing it to make more people happy. And we actually say this in the mission statement of the Apache Software Foundation. We're doing this for the public good. It's a charity. It's, it's altruism. But the public good contains many things other than just because it's fun. It's not all rainbows and ponies. Now, the great thing about this conference, the reason that I am still coming to this conference 24 years later, is that I get to hang out with some of my best friends in the world and sit around down at Jules Verne and uh, drink beer and uh, you know just generally enjoy myself. We all have stories, we have common experiences that we share. Um, there are always anecdotes that we tell, like we did last night as we were having beers around the table, about people in companies who just don't get it, and they're, they're kind of funny stories because we can, we can laugh at them behind their backs. But um, we also like to keep our jobs. So it's important to understand that that is not why your company does open source. Now, hopefully your company has given conscious thought to why they do open source. Hopefully is isn't just something they've fallen into and they've thought about their strategies around open source. But um, when I say do open source, that is a very vague way to talk about it that has multiple meanings. It might mean that they are consuming an open source shrink-wrapped product. It might mean that they are contributing changes to open source, and it might mean that they are actively taking code and placing it into open source. And these all have different strategies around them, and all of these tend to, at some point, be about profit. Uh, it tends to be about serving customers in order to make a profit. It, it's about making shareholders happy in order to make a profit. And if you're really lucky and you work for a great company, they also care about creating a good place for people to work. Um, and if you don't work for one of those companies, mine is hiring. Now, so when you talk to management, you need to be able to translate your passions into your company's motivations. Um, and often, your manager does not speak the same language. So this is a slide that I have in every presentation I ever give. Um, <laughs> This is, this is my disclaimer. My manager is a, a guy who you saw on stage this morning and is the president of the Apache Software Foundation. My manager has deep understanding of open source and a deep history in open source. Um, his manager, on the other hand, does not. And my manager's manager is brilliant but has different motivations than I do. And David protects me from management. That's what a good manager does. But uh, you still need to be able to speak the language. And I have become keenly aware over the last two years that uh, all of the great things that I say in this presentation are good in theory, but they're incredibly hard to actually do. And I'm, I'm still learning. I still have a lot to learn about this. Um, and. Uh, for those of you that were here in Bertrand's talk just earlier, he, he talked a little bit about, about this and about how important it is to translate into the language of the people that are listening to you and understanding the culture of the people that are listening to you and to take emotion out of it and rephrase. And Sander uh, uh, is editing a document that I wrote yesterday because of these things. And, and I, I was thinking as I was listening to Bertrand, it's really important when you write something to then share it with somebody from a different culture to see if, uh, if what you have said communicates well. So when you're talking to management about open source, you might speak, you must speak their language. And again, I'm not talking about lying. I'm not talking about uh, obfuscating your motives. I'm talking about understanding the context or the, the lens through which you will be understood. So, what's in it for the company? 
Well, it would be incredibly reductionist to say that your company only cares about the money. Now, that is, that is certainly a motivation of most companies. But, uh, you know, they're interested in serving the customer, which is largely about building trust. They are interested in producing a quality service or a quality product, which is about creating a legacy in some cases. Uh, making sure that people think well of the thing that you are producing and think that maybe you care about quality. Um, they are, they're interested in recruiting. So we'll talk a little bit about that later. Now, when you talk about open source, it is, uh, it, it's often, we, we often lead with philosophy. What is the philosophy of open source? Now, this book here is, is great. It is a uh, collection of essays from some of the people that were involved in open source in the very early days. And they talk in great depth about the philosophy around open source, the philosophy of free software. And you know free software and open source aren't the same thing, right? And uh, you can spend several hours explaining that to somebody while their eyes glaze over. Um, and if you do that, you'll miss your opportunity. So I do encourage you to read this book. I don't encourage you to give it to your manager on your first conversation with them when you're trying to communicate why it's important that they let you spend time on open source, because that's not why. Um, it's behind it, but it's not why. Um, you could also spend a great deal of time talking about the nuances of why the Apache software license is better than the GPL v3, and why the v3 is not quite as good as the 2 and the AG, whatever. Um, this is a great way to lose your opportunity uh, to speak with your manager and, under, and have them actually understand what you're talking about. <clears throat> you have a very short time to make that initial impression, to communicate clearly what you're trying to get across, and, uh, and also to persuade your audience that you're worth listening to. And spending that time on the nuances of free beer versus free puppies is uh, perhaps not the best way to use that time. One of the uh, one of the things that we tend to say, one of the phrases that we use when we talk about open source is giving back. And that implies that uh, contributing to open source is somehow a moral obligation, that this is a question of charity. It's a question of making the community happy, whatever the heck the community means. Um, but your company is not a charity. Now, I know there are some people here who do work directly for charities, and they have different motivations. But for, the most of, for most of us here, your company is not a charity. And your attitude that open source contribution is a moral obligation or somehow for the greater good does not communicate to your CEO very well, because they're not running the company uh, to make people happy necessarily or for the moral good. They're doing it because their, their shareholders expect the company to make a profit. Uh, one of my friends and colleagues, uh, Dawn Foster, uh, gave a talk a couple years ago where she said, if you talk about open source as though it's a charity, then you can guarantee that your department will be the first one cut when budget cuts come. So keep that in mind. So instead, what we want to talk about is, is the supply chain. Open source is part of your supply chain for, and you know, I'm using buzzwords here, and there's the supply chain with the weak link, and that is your open source project. And unless we invest in fixing that weak link and making the open source project sustainable, then two years from now, we won't have a product. And so involvement in the supply chain is, is critical. If you are a carpenter and you go cut down all the trees, that's awesome for this year. And next year, you're going to be out of a job. And, you know, all the analogies you might want to throw at this, but uh, when you have a resource, 
you cannot assume that that resource is infinitely available if you do not invest in sustaining it. So uh, this can be challenging when a company or more usually individuals in a company are interested only in the next quarter's uh, profits because investing in open source is an extremely long-term proposition. Your investments in open source today are not going to pay off for a year, two years, maybe five years. This is a long-term way to think about the sustainability of products and your supply chain. Um, don't be afraid to tell scary stories. Uh, don't overdo your scary stories because sometimes they come across as open source is dangerous and we should probably stay away from it. But uh, these three logos, I put these on here because making a name and a logo for a bug was a just a stroke of marketing genius because it elevated something uh, highly technical and kind of boring to international front page articles because that's that's kind of a you know, the cute little guy there looks really great on the front page, and then we can talk to experts about things that our audience might not understand, but it's scary, and uh, it's going to destroy the whole world. But uh, if, you, uh, if, if you tell these scary stories, be sure to back it up with, well, in every one of these cases, you know, Log4j is a great example. It was a scary story. But the community stepped up and fixed it, and they did that quickly and correctly and efficiently because it was transparent. It was visible to lots of people that could look at it and find a fix for it. The failing there was on the, on the part of companies that are, in fact, still running the old version, and that is a serious concern. Um, every... Technical presentation has to have this, this comic in it. Um, it's sort of a, an obligation in the speaker world. Uh, but uh, yes, this is the obligatory XKCD. Understanding that those things up on top are your company is important. And if you don't invest in, in uh, that thing down there at the bottom, then when it falls over, yeah, that's going to affect you. And, and this is something that, uh, you know, it's, it's amusing to look at it and think, ha-ha, that's not me. But, but understanding that this is you and understanding the sheer volume of code and products and services that rely on a library that you have never heard of because you haven't been producing an SBOM for your product, um, it's pretty important. So... I encourage you also to present data to your manager. Now, this is a completely imaginary paragraph there, but the point here is that the data that is represented here defining the risk of not investing in an open source project is about the financial cost, the human cost, the customer cost, and one of the things that we do at, at my company is... Uh, when we identify a, a open source project that is strategic, by which I mean we're building stuff on top of it, one of the questions that gets asked to the engineers is, what's it going to cost to replace it when that project dies? And if you aren't thinking in those terms, then you know, you, you haven't really understood the cost of your supply chain. You're pretending that it's free. And free is a, it, it's a word with so many different meanings, and it does not mean without cost. And I'll, I'll touch on that in a, in a minute again. Um, the, the word sustainable or project health, uh, these are words that are, that are thrown around and, and we kind of don't have a lot of clear definitions of them. I would encourage you to look at the, uh, the, Chaos Foundation that Ruth talked about 
um, in her keynote yesterday. That's C-H-A-O-S-S. And this is an organization that's defining metrics around what makes a project sustainable. Because that's a very difficult question, and it's multifaceted, and every project is a unique snowflake. And trying to apply the metrics from one project to another doesn't always work. So it's a complicated question. Um, but some of the things that we look at are, are there multiple vendors involved? Are there multiple maintainers involved? Is it responsive to customer or user needs? Um, do these stakeholders in the project actually participate in the project, or are they just consuming it? Um, yeah. So I'm going to show you a graph. This is a, uh, a project that is actually at the Apache Software Foundation. And the two colors there indicate the employer of the company that's involved. And hopefully you can see that if the, uh, if the dark blue company um, decides that they are no longer going to be shipping a particular product, then your risk is enormous. And uh, this, uh, the, the term that's used in, in chaos and in other organizations, this is the, the elephant factor. This is uh, the, the company that contributes most or all of the code. And uh, if you see a graph like this, it should alarm you. And uh, you know, I, I've, I've scratched out the company names there, but uh, I think Many of you are involved with, project, with projects that came immediately to mind when I showed you this graph. So what do you do as a company that is not one of those? Uh, well, you should, you should um, use a different project or you should get involved. These are really the, the two options here. And if the third option is to cover your eyes and hope for the best, then you are not serving your customers very well. Um, the other term of, of art is the pony factor. And this is actually a term that was coined by one of the infrastructure people here at the Apache Software Foundation. And this is what individual contributor is producing the most code. And uh, this is actually, um, this is the Airflow project. And you can see that it is a very diverse in terms of individual contributors. But you know, if you kind of look at that graph and you wonder, who's the, the, the pink contributor? And what happens if he changes employment? Um, well, actually, that is Yarek Pachuk. He's here at the, at the conference. He's amazing. Um, but uh, yeah, if, if, if Yarek wins the lottery and moves to a tiny Pacific island, maybe this project will be at a little bit of risk. And so that is something that when you're talking to your management, you need to make them understand that we need a pink guy in this project if we want to have influence or if we want to ensure sustainability, or maybe we need to have lots of those little boxes and so that the risk is spread. All right. One of the other reasons that people participate in open source is in order to build their personal profile. They do it because it makes them feel popular. And this is a, it's a perfectly legitimate reason to participate in open source, to make friends, to raise your personal profile, to make yourself uh, popular. These are my, my two older, extremely photogenic children. And uh, they were both very popular in high school, as you can tell, because they're so good looking. Um, but. Uh, when that becomes a motivation for doing things, and then you get old and ugly like myself, um, then maybe your reasons for participating uh, need to change a little bit. Um, here's my other kid. And uh, they're more interested in, in, in driving the bus. So here we are on vacation in the pilot seat of a, a helicopter and uh, learning how to fly a helicopter, which was a really cool experience. Um, so my other kid is, is much less concerned with being popular. Uh, they're interested in, in setting the narrative. They're, they're, they're the one that, that, uh, that is always wearing the weird things and dyeing their hair green. And uh, you want to be the one, your company wants to be the one, 
that is driving the conversation. Um, now, that's a dangerous thing to say. I don't mean go into a project and take over. I don't mean um, talking in public with words like, we are the leading developer of Apache Airflow, because that can devalue the contributions of the rest of the community. So hel helping your management understand culture of open source is critical. But also being involved in a project in a, in a demonstrative, loud way is critical to ensuring that your customers are heard in the conversation. So this is, it's a balancing act. You don't want to claim that, that you own or invented or are the sole creator of. But you also want to make sure that you are a voice that is heard, a voice that is uh, loud. Um, also understand that there's no guarantee that your contributions will be accepted. And this is something that I have uh, had a lot of conversations with at my, my, my company. You know, we, we opened a pull request, and then nothing happened. Um, where is this open source synergy that you've been talking about? It's just supposed to be magical, right? Um, well, no. You, you, need to, uh, you need to actually participate in the conversation. And you need to be a leader not only in this tiny little feature that you care about, but in the overall conversation of the project. You need to do um, the, as we say, uh, the, the chop wood and carry water. You need to do the things that are not glamorous. <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah, uh, surveys show, and you know that's that's a very easy thing to say because I don't have a reference here at my fingertips. But I've read many surveys that say that customers uh, that are that are engaged with open source projects look for your voice in the conversation, and if you're not there, then they're not going to trust you to be a leader in that community. This is one of my company's services. Um, we are uh, engaged in the conversation, and that in turn drives adoption, which lifts all boats. So one of the complaints that I hear frequently about our open source is, if I contribute this feature, then I will be helping my competitors. Yeah, that's true. Um, and that leaves you in the position of defining what your actual value proposition is. Um, AWS is not a software company, we're a services company, so our, our product is that uh, delivering the, the operation. And so to focus on the software misses the point. Instead, we contribute to these communities in order to make it better for everyone to increase the whole pie rather than just our slice of it. Which doesn't mean that that's an easy sell to management. Um, and I am almost out of time. One of the other things that is stated as a reason for participating in open source, as I mentioned, is that it's lots of fun. So this is a, a trip that I took to Kenya a little over a year ago, and I'm on the party bus with a bunch of my new friends who are all open source software developers, and it was a lot of fun. And um, open source is an endless party, and I come to these events to, to be with my friends, and your company, despite what they said when they were recruiting you, does not care about you having fun. That is not their motivation. Um, but, you know, instead, you can talk about recruitment. If you, uh, if you preach the message that your company is deeply engaged in open source and cares about these things, then you will attract developers who are deeply involved in open source and care about these things. Um, if you are absent from the conversation, you, you know, like, like uh, Dr. Daniel said this morning, you can't just say we're involved uh, because the community is watching and they know when you're lying. And so when I, when I started my new job, I was told my job was to improve the reputation of Amazon in open source. And there's two ways to go about that, right? There is put up a billboard that says we're awesome and great at open source which wouldn't have been true, um, or to actually become good at open source, which is the approach that I hope we're taking. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong afterwards in the hallway. Um, but you want to make sure that you 
create an environment where people, when they hear the name of your company, they think, oh, those folks are engaged in open source. Um, let's see. Oh, right. People involved in open source can be very opinionated. I don't know if you've experienced this. Um, and that may make them difficult to manage. So, uh, you know, keep that in mind when you're recruiting open source people. Understand what you're getting and plan accordingly. And that's why my manager is, is David Nally, because he understands me. Um, people often use open source as a way to build their resumes. And your employer is, not, is, is very not interested in you making your resume look better so you can go somewhere else. Or, or maybe they are, and then that's a problem. That's a red flag. But um, you, uh, th this is a very frequently cited reason for open source engagement in order to build my skill set, build my resume, make myself more hireable. Don't tell your manager that. Instead, tell them that this is part of your ongoing education. You are building skills. And this is one of the reasons why we want, and, and when I say we, I mean AWS, we want people engaged directly in the open source projects because it makes them better at their job. It makes them understand the entire project instead of just their tiny little feature of it. Um, it tells customers that we are experts, hopefully, because we are becoming experts by being actually engaged. And so it is. It is ongoing education. The other cool thing about being involved in open source, um, if you're doing it right, you're also on the user mailing list. And you're seeing all the things that the users are complaining about. And those users are your customers. Or maybe they're not, and they should be. And if they're complaining about the project, then your customers are suffering the same pain. And this gives you an insight that you would not have otherwise. Uh, a much broader insight than just the three customers that you talk to. This, this uh, photograph here is um, a cat that my daughter gave me for free. Um, this, this cat has uh, broken many valuable items around my house. Um, <laughs> and destroyed the door frame on the back of my house and uh, torn up some curtains and all of that to say that open source free software is free in exactly the same way that that kitten was um, and if you if you talk to your management and use terms like free what they're going to hear is well if we open source something it will magically get better the community will show up who is this community people keep talking about? It's, it's, very, it's very nebulous. And unless you are the community, then you can't really understand who the community is. Um, and free is a dangerous word to use. Open source is expensive. It's just as expensive as proprietary software. You're just investing in different places. Um, or if you're not investing in those different places, it's going to be expensive two years from now when all of a sudden that project has died or changed license, or in some other way become unavailable to you. So instead, what we want to talk about is creating customer value. Um, my wife is a jeweler, and this is one of the uh, gorgeous objects that she has made. And uh, creating jewelry is kind of like open source when you would Creating custom jewelry is like open source in that you are always listening to the customer and changing in response to what they need. And uh, so this particular item here was remade about five times because, it, mostly because my wife is a perfectionist, but also because the customer looked at it and said, it's not quite what I had in mind. Um, let's let's uh, have a, a pull request to change this this feature of it. And uh, this is the conversation that you're having with customers, hopefully. Open source is really cool because this, this conversation is not just, again, with the three customers that you have access to, but it's, to, it's with hundreds, thousands of customers and potential customers out there. You're having this ongoing conversation that are, that's making your product better in ways that you didn't know it needed. Um, one of the phrases 
that I've always hated around open source in business is the term freeloaders. Freeloaders are the people that use the open source instead of your paid product and they don't participate and they don't pay for it. And I hate that term because uh, those people have a valuable contribution. The people that just sit on your mailing list and complain all the time, don't ignore them because they're complaining for a reason. Um, by the same token, those of you involved in Apache projects, the people that complain about how your project is run or who complain about how the foundation is run, don't ignore them. Um, capture those responses and see how you can address them or ask the foundation to address them. And I am, I think I'm, I'm over time, but I just want to say there's so many other things we can talk about. One of the things that, that I hear all the time is can't we just fork this thing and so we'll have more control over it. That's a whole other talk. Um, can't we just write our own so we don't have to listen to these whining community, community members and so on and so on. Um, these are all very complicated questions. I don't want to indicate that with my 30 minutes, I've solved all of your problems in talking to management. I just want you to think about them. Think about how you are perceived when you're talking about your open source passion and try to speak the language of your management. And this is not a sprint. It is a long-term investment. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a marathon. So. Totally out of time. Um, if you have a brief question, I, I don't think I have time.